Welcome. We are looking at the solutions to the reading comprehension section of the free law prep mock test. You can attempt this test for free up to five times by visiting the official website discoverlaw.in. This passage talks about democracy and lies in the realm of the humanities and philosophy. Let us go ahead and have a look at the passage and the questions that follow. Before we go through the passage and the questions together, I'd like you to pause the video and read the whole passage by yourself once. Here's the passage on your screen, presented in a manner that makes it easy for you to read. Now take your time, read this completely by yourself, and then we'll go through it together. Alright, so I hope you've given it an attempt, a good reading by your own self, and now we'll go for this together, looking at it in a little detail, one or two lines at a time. Remember that the first line and the first paragraph are very important cues to understanding the essence of the entire passage. Generally, in most passages of the LSAT India, the first paragraph lays out the plot for you. Therefore, read this a little carefully. It reads in this question, if democracy is to work, it requires a certain level of political competence on the part of its citizens. What standards must citizens meet in order to be considered politically competent? In a good polity, the citizens should possess both knowledge of the public good and a sustained desire to achieve it. That is, they should possess civic virtue. So this, as you see here, is what they call civic virtue. So what we see here is it talks about citizens in a democracy. Uh -huh. Because we're looking at the first paragraph, we need to know what it is being, what it is talking about. Okay. And then it says that citizens should have some amount of political competence. Then it asks you, what is the standard of this competence? And then it answers that the standard is to possess civic virtue. Let us move ahead. Look at this little line that's been highlighted. Yet this formulation immediately suggests a problem. Now this is a very important stage in any reading comprehension passage because what you've found here is the problem, okay? Sometimes you'd find the problem spelled out to you in the first paragraph, but this time it happens to be in the first line of the second paragraph. What generally follows in most reading comprehension passages at this point is that you'd see either a debate or a problem, and then you'd see the two sides of the debate, some discussion, some points from either side, and then you'd find that you know the last paragraph gives you either the author's conclusion or provides a solution to the problem, you know, you find something on these lines. So to understand structure is very useful in being able to properly comprehend a reading comprehension passage. Okay, so now that you have this, this anticipation, let us go ahead. Right, so what we see here is definitely going to tell you as to what the problem is. It reads, how are citizens expected to know what constitutes the public good? Okay, so we saw here that citizens should possess the knowledge of public good. The problem is that it's asking you as to how citizens may be expected to know what it is. Okay, so here's the problem. And then it says that the answers to this question generally fall into two categories, which might be called the classical view and the modern view. So the question, how can you know what the public good is? And then it says that the answers fall into two categories. The first is the classical view, and it says, the classical view is that citizens should seek the good of some larger collective, okay, of which they are a part. Today, however, innumerable collective entities exist to which a citizen might be attached, from one city to one's humankind. Thus, the classical view provides no guidance about which public's good a citizen should seek, okay. So what we saw here is that the classical view tells you that how do you know the public good? So you look at the goal of a larger collective, the good of a larger collective. Okay. But then it goes on to tell you that, look, there are so many collectives you are a part of. So maybe you're a part of your religion. Maybe you're a part of your, your housing society. You're a part of your school. So how do you decide which collective you are to think about? And then it goes on to say that since there are so many, the classical view provides no guidance. And then there's the modern view for which we see nothing in this paragraph. So what do you expect? Maybe in the next paragraph, we'll get something about the modern view. So you see, this is active reading. As I read it, I'm really 
putting things into my mind in the in, in a structure there's a skeleton there's some anticipation there's comprehension do not be a person who simply reads a passage like this you know like yeah this formulation suggests a problem citizens are expect if you going to read it like that it makes absolutely no sense be active okay let's go ahead right so as expected this begins with talking about the modern view okay so it says the modern view begins with the assumption that each citizen is moved by self-interest. Okay. So here you are saying the the public good where you're looking at the a collective, right? But here it says that the modern view begins with the assumption that each citizen is moved by self-interest. Using this formulation, the public good then consists of the total of all individual interests, which must be aggregated or integrated according to some justifiable principle like majority rule. Okay. So you're saying that you take a total of the individual interests. The modern view simplifies the problem of political competence by ensuring that the sustained desire to achieve the public good will ultimately be found in the competition and compromise among individual interests. So what you're saying here is that since every person is moved by self-interest and they can think about it, one doesn't need to have political competence, which means you don't need to know you don't need to have knowledge of public good. You simply add up, you simply aggregate the the sense of self-interest. Okay, So the total of individual interest is public good. So we understand this. It simplifies the problem. So at this point, one might be inclined to believe at this point, like I said, because I'm being an active reader, so I'm thinking about what the author thinks. At this point, it appears that the author believes that the modern view is a little better. Anyway, let's go ahead and see if what I just felt is true or not. When you see this line here, it says to advocate this view. Now, what's the meaning of advocate? It means to support. So it says to support this view. Which view is it talking about? Is it the modern view or the classical view? So you see the immediate preceding paragraph was about the modern view. So this view refers to the modern view, which we know is moved by self-interest. It says... To advocate this view does not require one to deny that individuals may have an interest in protecting or advancing ends of some larger community to which they belong. So what it's saying here is that it is not required for one to believe that self-interest is only confined to oneself. Maybe someone might want to actually advance the ends of some larger community. In fact, it goes on to say that they most certainly will at times. Still, the modern view does make weaker moral demands on citizens so it says that although individual interest may lie in protecting or advancing the ends of someone larger it makes a lesser moral demand right morally it does not require you to think so much about others right so that's way that way it is more self-centered so to speak you know it does not make such a strong moral demand on citizens let us go ahead Look at this sentence, really long. It starts here and goes up to this. Understanding a sentence like this requires you to break this sentence down into smaller comprehensible parts. Okay. Now, how do you do that? You look for some points specifically where you can break it because the full stop is just here. So you need to make some chunks that you can understand by yourself. Let's go ahead and see this together. It says, and if we assume that it is easier for citizens to acquire an, an adequate understanding of their own interests than of others' interests. And that, therefore, uh -huh. this is a point where you can kind of break it down once. So it says here, if we assume that, if we assume that, and you see the same thing again, and if we assume that, right? So that's how and works. And is a conjunction that if we assume this and we assume that, so there are two things, right? So when you say that, get me milk and get me water, you can just say, get me milk and water. So we assume that and that, okay? So it's kind of like you can read the assume even before this, okay? So let's look at the first part. It says, if we assume that it is easier for citizens to understand their own interests, okay? And that therefore, incentives for acting in their own interests are stronger than incentives to achieve the interests of others which means acting in self-interest is easier because the incentives are stronger when you act for your own self okay so let's write this down self-interest is better known right it's easier to know 
and you also find that it's more likely to be acted upon because the incentives are greater okay it goes on to say then the modern view requires some form of civic education in order to create truly competent citizens able to integrate their competing interests so since each person let's say this is one person okay now this person is thinking about himself okay this person is thinking about herself this person is again thinking about himself so you have people who think only about themselves now you need to give these people some sort of civic education so that they learn how to integrate what they all think okay so what you can see here is that in according to the modern view if the modern view is to be followed right since everyone's thinking for one's own self we need to give them some education civic education to teach citizens to integrate competing interests simple let's go ahead so we saw in the line preceding this the previous line that you require to give civic education right so what's written here is that the issue of political competence is thus reduced to the problem of educating people to know and understand the needs of others okay so what has happened until now the author showed two views the classical view and the modern view he said that the classical view really does not work then he went on to speak about the modern view and then cited a problem in the modern view that it requires for people to be taught and then says that therefore the problem is reduced to the problem of educating as we saw in the previous line okay let's go ahead but the large scale and diversity of modern society would seem to impede empathetic understanding of the anonymous others who compose the great bulk of one's fellow citizens so we identified the problem as requiring people to be educated and understand the needs of others but then there's a problem it says here that there are so many people right and they're anonymous you don't know who they are how do you identify and how do you have empathy for these people you don't know how can this be done right it says that in the absence of such empathy civic virtue would require an obedience brought by a strictly abstract awareness of the good so if you don't have empathy so what's saying here in the absence of empathy you don't feel you don't feel for the other person you don't think what it is like to be the other person then this virtue would have to come by you know something which is very strictly abstract because it's not your own you don't understand it right and it is obedience so maybe that comes through the law you don't feel it you don't believe it but you have to follow it because you have to be obedient to something that is quite abstract for you okay let's go ahead and see the next line right if democracy requires such an awareness surely its prospects in modern society are dim very important line remember the last few lines give you the conclusion of the passage okay just like the first paragraph is important this is very important it says if democracy requires such an awareness what awareness it requires you awareness this one abstract awareness of the good it says if democracy requires such an awareness surely its prospects in modern society are dim right this means that the prospects of democracy are dim which means democracy may not do well in modern society it goes on to say achieving political competence becomes a question of whether and how it may be possible to promote a more widespread capacity for empathy among citizens right so he said that now this problem which we saw here requires people to understand the needs of others so you can either get this through empathy right but he said empathy is very hard so because of which you might require to be obedient to an abstract awareness of good but in this line 
he says that if democracy requires such an awareness, then it's dim. So he kind of strikes this out and then talks about empathy once again. So he sums it up as saying, achieving political competence thus becomes a question of whether and how it may be possible to promote a more widespread capacity for empathy among citizens. Let us now go ahead and look at the questions together. If you wish, you could pause the video, take a moment to look at the entire passage and assess your level of comprehension before we proceed to the questions. Try solving this question first by yourself before listening to the explanation. Okay, let's do this together. According to the passage, the classical and the modern views differ primarily with respect to... We'd seen this about the classical view and the modern view a little while back. Okay. We'd seen that basically you were trying to see as to what the knowledge of public good is. How can one know what the public good is? The classical view tells you something about what public good... a uh, public good is and the modern view tells you something about what the public good is. Once you understand this without getting into the details of what the views are, look, the question is not really asking you as to what the details of the classical and the modern views are. It only is asking you where they differ, right? So where is the difference? These are two different ways of conceiving what public good is and therefore the answer to this is C. They differ in their conception of the public good. On the one hand, the classical view believes that the public good is the good of the larger collective, right? And here, the modern view, public good is believed to be moving by self-interest, right? Simple question if you understand structure. Right. Pause the video, solve it by yourself, and then we'll go for it together. Okay, the question reads... Which one of the following is the most accurate characterization of what the author thinks is wrong with the classical view? So looking at what the author thinks is wrong with the classical view, and then we see as to which of these options is the closest to that. Now, instead of looking at the options, let's just see as to what the author thinks is wrong. You can obviously find that in the second paragraph. And by the end, he says that the classical view provides no guidance about which public good a citizen should seek because it says that there are so many collectives that it's hard to choose. Now, when you, when you know that this is the, the uh, criticism of the author, you can just look at the options and you'd find the answer immediately. It's unworkable given the number of groups to which a citizen may have allegiances. Well, this is an interesting question and also a little challenging. Pause the video, try solving it by yourself. We look at it together thereafter. Okay, so the question reads, with which one of the following characterizations of the modern citizen would the author most likely concur? So what you're being asked here is that there's a modern citizen and what do you think the author thinks about this modern citizen? And then we pick the option that most resembles that characterization. So let's begin by reading the passage, by looking from the passage and seeing as to what the author thinks about the modern citizen. The first thing that he highlights here is that the modern view begins with the assumption that each citizen is moved by self-interest. Okay. Now, being moved by self-interest doesn't mean that they are fully selfish and that we can see in the lines that follow. He says here that to advocate this view does not require one to deny that individuals may have an interest in protecting or advancing the ends of some larger community. In fact, he says that indeed they will at times. Also, we saw that in the third paragraph that it is easier to know self-interest and therefore there is a greater incentive to act upon it. However, the author also does point out that it is possible for competent citizens, once they are educated, to integrate their competing interests. Now, once you've seen this, it becomes quite clear that the answer to this is A. It talks of a person who is not entirely selfish, right? It's, it's different uh, to be guided by self-interest and something different to be entirely selfish, okay? Now, if you look at some of the other options, let's say you look at option B, which is the wrong answer. What that would mean is when you see something like weaker moral character, this is taking it too far. You do see weaker moral, but it talks about a weaker moral demand, right? So you're saying that the modern view has a weaker moral demand, 
but that doesn't mean that people who are you know modern citizens have weaker moral character so you should you should stick to what the requirement of the question is do not go beyond the passage the answer is generally pretty straightforward and pretty simple now if you understand the technique well enough then finding out the primary purpose of a passage is not hard in fact these are those kind of questions that you can answer even without rereading the passage because if you've been able to comprehend the passage then you definitely know as to what the purpose of the passage is let me give you a hint here the primary purpose of a passage generally is to outline a problem or to provide the solutions to a problem to outline a debate show both sides arrive at a conclusion that's what the purpose is and this is something that you generally find in the beginning of the passage okay so what you can see in the first line of the second paragraph was that there is a problem and the passage now goes on to solve this problem right so solving the problem is one of the primary purposes of this passage so this is the first thing that you should look for in the options does any option talk about solving problems the other thing is what do you see here about the problem it kind of tells you at the beginning that you know what we cannot have the classical view and then it talks about how you can use the modern view that there are some limitations and that there's a certain way it has to be implemented okay once you've identified this it becomes quite clear that the answer is e it tells you what must be done if the modern view is to give a satisfactory solution to the problem of political competence you can also see that the word problem is there in this okay but if you read the option it says argue that neither the modern nor the classical view can adequately address the problem it does not say this it does say that the classical view provides no guidance but he does not say the same about the modern view all he says that there are some requirements there are some some solutions that require to be made for the modern view to be effective so the question says which one of the following views is most reasonably attributed to the author of the passage what is the meaning of attributed to the author of the passage it means which one of the views here do you think proceeds from the passage which means that which of the following do you believe the author believes in now where do you see the viewpoint of the author obviously you see it in this entire passage this is where he's shown his opinion if you are to draw from the passage as to what viewpoint might be held by the author you obviously need to base that on your overall understanding of the passage remember that the author has presented his view throughout the passage so if you do not have a feel or an understanding of what the passage overall is you are likely to get this question wrong so at this point like with the main point question i want you to think about what the main point or the main opinion of the author is as you can see in this passage it talks about two kinds of views there's the classical view it talks about the modern view and like with most passages in the else hatching that there are two views the author either sides with one view or takes a balanced view of both in this particular passage what do you think the author has done what does he favor does he completely favor or disfavor any one side pause the video for a second and think about it i'm telling you what it is in a bit but you may want to pause the video and think about it okay let me tell you if you see this you can see that the author discusses both the sides right and he offers his criticism for both therefore you can see that he neither fully accepts nor fully rejects either which means that he sees the merits of both of these having understood this picking the answer is not hard you can see that in b it talks about empathy and self interest empathy is kind of something that you can relate to the classical view and self interest it's about the modern view okay and therefore you can see here that he says that both are important read this question now it says which one of the following if true would most strongly challenge the author's characterization of the prospects for democracy in modern society now as you can see understanding this question is not the simplest of tasks let me help you out with this it says which one of the following would most strongly challenge the author's characterization right which means that there is a certain characterization of the prospects for democracy that the author has 
you are to pick the option that goes contrary to it, which challenges it. Okay, so you're going to challenge what the author thinks the condition. So prospects is kind of like the future condition. The condition of democracy would be in modern society. Okay, now you can obviously see that you can find that in the last paragraph because it kind of looks like the conclusion here. Okay, and when you see this, you can actually see exactly the word that you're looking for. If you see here, you can see the word prospects, right? And he's talking about the need for awareness. And he says when he concludes here that, hey, there's very little political awareness. And therefore, he goes on to say that the prospects are dim, which means that according to him, the prospects are not great, which means that it cannot succeed. So according to him, since there is lack of awareness, since there's lack of empathy, okay, since there's lack of civic virtue, democracy cannot succeed. Now you have to challenge this, which basically means that, hey, you're going to say that even if there is no political awareness, even if there's no civic virtue, still it is possible for something to succeed, for democracy to succeed. Once you've understood this, picking the option is really easy. You may want to pause the video and try it yourself. I'm giving you the answer in two seconds. Okay, here goes. When you look at option B, it says many democracies have flourished, which means they've done well, despite a lack of political competence in their citizenries, which means that citizens don't have political competence, which means there's no awareness. But despite the lack of awareness, democracies have done well. So it challenges what the author believes. Thank you.